Hello, hello everyone. Welcome uh, to our May's Customer Insights webinar session. Uh, first of all, I'd like to check that everyone hears me okay. Uh, please let me know in the chat that if, if the audio is okay, so I know. Okay, okay, all good. Great, thank you so much. Uh, also, um, I wanted to let you know at this point already that this webinar will be recorded and we will send you the link after the session and post it in our YouTube channel so, so you can get back to this session afterwards as well. I'm your host today. Uh, I'm Rina, uh, Product Marketing Manager at Solibri. Hello. Working still at home like many of us are still today in this crazy world. And uh, our agenda today, uh, we have uh, Joel Ullmann from Skanska Sweden uh, talking about achieving BIM requirements. Uh, he will show also very concrete project examples uh, with, with uh, Solibri demos. So it will be a great session again. And then, like usually, we will have also the question and answer part in the end of the session. So you can, at any point of the presentation, you can send your questions in the chat and we will go them through in the, in the uh, end of, of this webinar session. And before we, we start the actual presentation, uh, we have a poll for you, which we would like to uh, do. So this time we are asking what is the most important reason for you to utilize Solibri or maybe it's another BIM software if you don't use Solibri. So I will give you a few minutes to answer. Yes, there are many answers coming in, looking very interesting. Let's give it a couple more minutes. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone who responded. And let me show you the results. So majority of you are using Solibri or other BIM software uh, to improve the quality of, of designs. And also many of you use it for collaborating between different stakeholders. These are clearly the, the most used or, or most important reasons to use. Use the software. All right, but now let's get to the point itself. I will give the floor to Joel just a second while I give you the presenter rights. So welcome, warmly, warmly welcome to our webinar, Joel. The floor is yours. Yes. So, uh, hi everybody who's on the uh, link right now. Um, I will tell you first a little, little bit about myself and the company that I work for, uh, Skanska in Sweden. I'll just hide my webcam for myself so I don't see it. There we are. Uh, yes, so this webinar is about Skanska Sweden's validation and the general usage of Solibri. And I will also show you some parts of um, the rule set management system where you can set up uh, own rule sets for validating your models within Solibri. Uh, I, my name is Joel Oman and uh, yes, so first, sorry. First, I would like to uh, exclude my thanks to Solibri for letting me host this. Uh, little presentation. Um, uh, I work closely with them and uh, they are a great uh, software supplier and also the program itself is uh, very versatile 
which is also why we have started using it in, in a on a large scale in Skanska Sweden. So here we are, myself, and uh, I am, my name is Joel Erman. I work as uh, a digital leader since 2018 in Sweden. Um, I have formerly been working as a construction designer and also as a BIM coordinator, uh, which is basically what I'm using Solibri as a software for. But uh, I have also in my new role then started streamlining the workflows and also generate better conditions for both the designers and the site operations. And uh, I also use Solibri as a sort of stepstone or uh, showing um, site operators who have not been using 3D models at all in their life, uh, how they can efficient, uh, more efficiently look at how the models are built or how their projects are built up. I am also the software owner of uh, Solibri for Skanska Sweden. Uh, which means that I handle license uh, issues and uh, also sort of support for Skanska Sweden. Skanska itself, in short facts, uh, it was founded in 1887 down in the south of Sweden uh, in a region called Skåne. Uh, in Sweden we have about 9,200 employees and 30, uh, 34,800 worldwide. Uh, we're located in 10 countries in Europe and also operate in the US and uh, we have a lot of safety and uh, health uh, restrictions at our workplaces. Um, we are also part of uh, the initiative for Fossil Free Sweden by 2045. And um, as you can see, we have a, a sort of three quarters of our turnover set into the green construction according to the green map, which is set up by Skanska itself and it's also followed by, uh, for instance, Volvo when creating the uh, uh, machines that they use at the uh, cement factories and so forth. So uh, we are very much into the green environment stuff in that part. Within Skanska, we have something that we call in Swedish kravspecifikation för modell och informationshantering, and it's shortened by KMI. The KMI is used to uh, as a sort of documentation to uh, make the design that the designers are producing, like the drawers and the structural drawers, um, more efficient. To, uh, to actually um, be able to use it later on within like uh, uh, continuous phases of the project. Like when you move from uh, just the design phase to the building phase, we want to be able to move the model along and still be able to extract information that is valid or relevant. Um, uh, in Sweden, we also have something called uh, the BIP system, which is building information properties. And uh, this system allows us to uh, actually make models or, or uh, the designers to make models that have the information that we require uh, in specific places within the models, like specific properties. And uh, they can streamline this down to every project, which means that even if we're working with one architect in one project and another architect in another, we will still be able to extract the information that we need from the same parameters or the same properties uh, within the models. And um, this is all um, being like uh, the requirements for this in a certain project is set with this KMI or the cross specification. Uh, and this is kind of how it looks like. It's basically a, a sort of a system where you have the BIP codes and you can uh, tell which uh, code is supposed to be on a certain object within the model. And uh, what we do then after this is that we, um, uh, we, we build a rule set within Solibri, which I'm going to show you next, um, that has um, uh, that looks for these certain properties within the model so that we can use them later on. So now we're going to jump over to one of the projects that we have. Um, and uh, this is, if you haven't seen Solibri before, you always start off in the model field, as you can see up here, where you have the possibility to actually look at how the model is um, built up, almost like in every other sort of um, software that you use for 3D validation. But what is different with this, within Solibri then is uh, if I go over to the checking, I have the possibility to create these rule sets which will look inside my model 
for like uh, general controls, uh, like if is the is the date supplied in every model? Uh, do we have duplicates, like objects that are not supposed to be in the same place, like tw two pillars in one place, and so forth? And it will check all the different uh, types of models, so the architectural, the structural, the sprinkler, and so on. And then we also have these specific requirements for specific models like space validation, if spaces are in touching walls or if they're like pouring over to some other pro uh, parts of the project, um, like room names for the spaces must be there and there must be no duplicates of the room names. Also, we check for these, um, these parameters or the, the, um, the properties uh, like type ID, is it available on every uh, um, object within this part of the model that it needs to have? Do we have the fire rating? Do we have the sound level and so forth? And we also do this in uh, different, in the uh, construction models and all those also in the installation models. One thing though, is that the installation models today, um, if I were to open up like only the, uh, uh, VVS or the water and the heating model. Uh, some of the designers today have trouble getting all of this uh, information that we need within this PIP system. So what we also do uh, with the, the installation models is that we actually tell the um, installation designers to uh, actually export all of the information that they have within a certain object. So we get like, uh, if I were to press on a, a, a pipe or click on a pipe, I can see the length uh, and, and the uh, what system it's in and the system code and everything and also the connection size and stuff. And uh, what Solibri then does is it actually extracts this information and we can use it as a sort of information takeoff system to to be able to see whether uh, how many kilometers or meters of pipes are in the building and so forth so it's very versatile but it needs uh, it needs to have some sort of requirement and validation uh, within the model so we know where the information will land so we can actually extract it afterwards and in this checking we can actually see that we have some issues that there are some places that this is not being applied, maybe to a different, uh, maybe it's to some objects um, within the model. But we will look at uh, that later on how and how we set this up and where to find which objects are supposed to have this type of properties. So this is basically the validation check that we do with every model that we get. Uh, we also have, of course, a normal sort of uh, intersection where we check the different models between each other to see whether objects intersect with each other but that is a whole different thing that doesn't have to do anything with the validation really that is with the progress of the model building so i will go back to the presentation um yes as i told you right now the uh Solibri is used as a validation for the kmi so we're using Solibri's uh, rule set manager to build these rule sets where it checks whether different things are in the model or not, and that duplicates are not allowed, for instance. But with Solibri within Skanska, we do more than just validate our projects. We also use the powerful ITO system, the information takeoff, to uh, extract in the information that has been built up with, with the KMI or with the uh, rule sets and uh, see whether these properties match where we're, what we're looking for. So, for instance, we have a big project coming up here in Gothenburg, um, where we have, with classifications, for instance, set uh, the different parts of the uh, structural uh, parts of the building, where we have uh, um, reinforcement. So we can actually extract uh, all the reinforcements from a different part, uh, different parts of the building. Uh, if I want to check, like the uh, foundation, where we are gonna like put the, the the highest tower of the building up, I can actually extend this and look at different parts of uh, just the 
Piles uh, Foundation. And then I can go into the ITO software that we have in software or in Solidary. And uh, I can do a sort of takeoff like this. And I have only now extracted the information regarding these uh, piles. So I can I can get an, uh, like all the information on how many uh, reinforced bars there are, what steel type they are, also if there's angles in them, if they're like bent in some way. I can also get the information on the what main color and uh, secondary color that is used for like when when they uh, they arrive on site, so we know which parts they're going to be built into in the foundation. And uh, this is really uh, a good system to work with because we can basically insert all the information that we need uh, within the project and then we can extract all the information in a different in the order that the supplier or the the uh, uh, the ones making the reinforcement they can actually just uh, get this report with uh, a template that we built and um, we can send this report to Excel and send this Excel list to the um, supplier, and then we'll, they will just chip all of the reinforcing bars that we need, what uh, dimension they are, uh, the uh, amount that we want, and how the length of them will be, and also the cut length, and uh, all of them will be color-coded so they know uh, when it arrives on site what, uh, what the purpose of this uh, special bar is. And we also set the uh, total weight and the weight of the uh, separate um, uh, reinforcing bars are. So the ITO system is used for uh, both this part and uh, also for um, extracting like information on uh, different windows and different wall types and the area of the walls and, and stuff like that. Um, and th this is actually the former most reason why we're using this software right now, both in calculation and also in uh, site works. And, uh, and this is an example of how uh, powerful it can be when the designer are working together with the production, um, the site managers, to have everything included within, uh, within the model, within the same model. So everybody's actually using the same model from the design phase to the checking and all the way to the site operations. And maybe in the future, we will also be able to supply these models as a sort of a facility management uh, models. But right now, uh, as we see it, it's a very powerful tool to use in this way. We also are in the stages of using Solibri to um, um, get specific uh, types of objects um, re, uh, ITO'd or taken off from the project, uh, but also in, in different um, stages of um, how we're going to build this certain building. So that would mean that we actually can set a sort of property on, uh, on different objects in the model, uh, which is a location tool, as a location tool, sorry. So what we basically do is we add a, a sort of um, property which tells us which part of the building this is. And this is then used via the ITO so we can actually select which part of the building we want to show. So if I choose like the first one here, and I do a take of all, yeah, I will see only the objects that are in this part of the building. Um, so this is, this is the first part that's being built right now of this building. And uh, when we move on to like the second, the third or the fourth part, I can actually just switch to that and we will see what building 
uh, objects are being built into that part and then the next one is the fourth uh, and then we have like the the middle part also and this means that i can actually take this part of the building i can search for a specific object within that part of the building so the solidbury software is now searching for all the doors here are all the doors in in this project but then I can actually do a selection of the doors. And I will only get the doors that are in this part of the building. And I can, of course, also add the location to get the floor level. So I can see how many of a specific door, like the FD01 here, is available on that floor. This also brings up the possibility of having a sort of just-in-time system when you order uh, the different building objects to the uh, site operator, uh, which means that we don't have to have like every window for the whole project standing on site at one moment, or we can just select that part of the building. We want to build have all the windows from this part first delivered, or maybe just a couple of floors from this part. So then we can actually exclude the windows and we will do the same we will do a, a selection takeoff and here we have the windows for that part of the building and then we can also just if we want to uh, only have the windows from from floor 12 and these are those so uh, both as a, a selection tool and a, a, a sort of filter tool we have a lot of possibilities to use Solibri as a, a um, not just in the design phase to, to check for uh, intersections between models and different uh, components within the models. We can also do information takeoffs on different parts of buildings and we can do information takeoffs on floor levels. Uh, we can go all the way down to uh, space level also because you have uh, spaces which are, are room um, uh, tells you which uh, part of the, uh, the room or a specific apartment that you're in and uh, we can do takeoffs on, on those two but uh, the main issue right now is that the um, uh, it's it, it we don't have a project I don't have a project to show you right now that has the spaces lined up in the right manner in order to do this types of takeoffs but basically you could actually go down all the way To the bottom there we have all the walls but if i want to have just for that part it'll be like this then i can also set to have the area and everything of that excluded so working with solibri um, we try to make the software as versatile as possible so we can actually use it both for the validation of models and also use it to um, have uh, um, the site operators use the 3d models more because it, as i said earlier many people working out on sites don't even know how to use a 3d model and this is quite new to them so we, we uh, basically use it to to also extend the knowledge of the project so instead of just looking at drawings on site you can actually look at the whole model on site uh, the whole building on site and uh, we, we can have specific parts of the building extracted so we only want to see uh, this part first because that's what's being built right now and uh, we can do takeoffs of different objects and we can also have them set up so we can choose to look at for instance all of the um, windows that have a certain uh, classification or a certain property so for instance if i were to uh, uh, have all the information that or maybe i wanted to extract all the windows that have a certain sound level i could do that and uh, as, as uh, when when ordering the windows then we know exactly what type of windows are supposed to have that sound level or 
a different fire rating and so forth. And these are all controlled by properties, of course, and we need to validate that these properties are in the build or in the model. And that is why we do the rule set building. We build the rule sets to check whether these properties are available. And these can also like be altered because of the uh, different types of demand that we have on different projects. But we want to have like a lower level. So this is the, the type of system that we always work with. And then we can extend that if there is a project that actually wants more information um, in some parts. Or if there is a tight uh, uh, timeline for the project, we might have to uh, exclude some things, but we will keep the things that are most important, the things that the uh, site managers will actually use. Uh, so we have a tight uh, conversation between the project uh, from start and with the site operators or the project managers um, to see whether how much information we want to include and then we make the KMI, the uh, Carol Specification, which means that the documentation will be set up to actually collaborate with the project more and then uh, we can use the KMI also to check uh, what properties are supposed to be included in this project or not and we can set the rule sets uh, in order to work that way. So in Solibri then we have the rule set manager and this uh, rule set manager is very comprehensive. Um, it doesn't just uh, make you evaluate collisions and uh, like uh, the, the um, uh, intersections between different objects but you can also do uh, relations between different uh, objects and as it said there, you can also do like distance checking. So in Solibri, uh, under the file menu, you will find the rule set manager. And within the rule set manager, uh, if I close it down like this, it will basically look like this when you start it up. Um, you can create a new rule set here. And uh, I have done that already. Yeah, you have this button here where you create it. And uh, if I open it up, I can see that. I have a lot of rules here which I can then drop down into the rule set in order to um, to create different rules for my rule set. If you look at the one that is open right now, the KMI test, if I were to open this instead of the new rule set that I've created, I can see for instance that if I want to the rule set to check for the parameter that is supposed to be type ID within the KMI, um, I have set it to look in the architectural model because it's the a, the architecture model that we are looking at here. And uh, then I told the rule set that this um, type ID property, it must exist within the doors, the windows, the walls, the furniture and the suspended ceiling. Um, this can always, oh, of course, be altered to whatever objects that you want to see this type ID property in. So if I look for instance in the construction model, I want it to be in the slab, the walls, the columns, the beams, the roof and the reinforcing bar. So if it, do if it doesn't exist, Solibri will give me a notice uh, when I do the checking. And uh, this is basically uh, how we validate that the, the um, properties that we set up in the KMI are in the model. And as I said, we also have general rules like duplicates are not allowed uh, within like walls. And then Solibri will look at uh, architecture walls and then compare with architecture walls um, on the same place. It will check for duplicates. So there's wall checked with wall. And this is basically how a normal um, collision test works. So if you go back to the new rule set that I made here, we have this rule called the general intersection rule. And this is the one that you actually insert one component. So I can insert whatever component I want to have checked. If it's a specific component, I can choose to have, for instance, I want uh, doors to be checked with uh, another specific component 
maybe just the uh, beams. So this is all I'm looking for, doors and beams. And it will check if there are duplicates also within this, if they're inside, if they're overlapping, and I can also set how much tolerance I want to have. So this, this is like the, the most basic uh, general intersection rule. But then, of course, you have many other different uh, things that Solibri can check. And this is what makes it uh, stand out from other different types of validation software products. Um, so I've also included something called component distance here. And in this specific project, we were interested in knowing how many installation uh, or map design um, objects like uh, pipes and, and uh, stuff were uh, at a specific height from the floor. There were a minimum, a minimum required distance. So what we did is we actually took the slab, all the different slabs that we have within this project. Um, there are like uh, different types of slabs uh, depending on which floor, uh, which uh, floor plan we are on. And then we checked it with all of the components, any component, it, was, it wasn't a special type of component, but with any component that is within the cooling, electrical, heat, plumbing, sprinkler, and ventilation. And this means that we set the minimum required distance to 2250. And uh, the program will then check from top to bottom, like top on the lower object and bottom on the upper object. And uh, we'll also only check the objects that are directly above. And this enabled us to see whether there were uh, faulty, because, uh, faulty installation because it needed to be a certain height from, from the um, uh the the floor plans or the sorry um the slabs but this could be like any object to any other object so we've also built a, a rule like this that checks um i will actually sh show that um because we want to have the ability to lift suspended ceilings and see if um uh, we need to have a clearance of at least 30 millimeters on suspended ceilings in order to be, to be able to lift them up and do maintenance on the pipes and stuff that is above of the suspended ceiling. And then we need a clearance of at least 30 millimeters to be able to do that. So we also did uh, checking between suspended ceiling in the architectural model with the uh, different disciplines and with any type of component. You can actually specify exactly what you want to have checked instead of just having a general uh, checking between like any component in one sort of system or in one sort of uh, model with uh, any component in another model kind of like we do in in other uh, validation programs Also, there is a very, very interesting rule that I'm going to show you here. It's uh, the free area in front of components um, where we could set a, a certain components. I have actually set this up also in our test here. Oh, sorry, not that one, in that one. And it works kind of like it will look at the windows and then it will look uh, in front of the windows if this window were to be um, openable, I could open it in like I, either direction, either uh, in or out. The program will actually look uh, for the the width of the window and then try to see whether if it were open, would will there be something standing in the way for the uh, 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 the open window? And this is how we actually find like uh, when we put radiators uh, too high, maybe there. Uh, the designer has put the radiator too high we can actually see whether the window will crash into it when it, when it opens this is also done for doors because doors of course are mostly openable or all of them are openable um, so it will check whether if i open this door will it hit something that is on the other side and it's very very versatile because we do we find clashes and clash detections that aren't really clashes if you look at it from a, a a standpoint of uh, how um, um, how the, the model is made because basically um, a, 
a pile standing or a column standing outside of a, an openable door um, is not going to directly connect with the door but if the door were to open it will connect and then we will get a clash from that but this can also be used in a different way because we have um, uh, when when they're doing a big um, ventilation um, rooms and and uh, stuff you need to be have need to have a certain uh, free distance for the maintenance of the big um, uh, the big uh, uh, components within the ventilation rooms and um, then you can actually set this to we need to have at least 600 millimeters of distance in order for someone to walk through here and uh, and the, the, then we can set that to a specific product we can choose a specific component just to have that um, in, in um, if you look at the model on in the ventilation model We have these down in in the um, in the ventilation uh, room, and you want to have a certain distance between this object and that object. We can actually set it to look for this specific object and see whether there there is anything standing 600 millimeters or closer within this area, and have the program check for that so it's a very very versatile uh, you can actually like set any type of pro uh, component here if you have specific needs for a specific project and all of these are are very comprehensively built on how you want to uh, add or distract things from them um, so boiler for instance property can be set to whatever if it's just all boilers but you can also uh, use the uh, um, identification or or like if you have a certain name i don't think i have any boilers in this project so no it, it's empty here um or at least we don't have a component that's actually named boiler but we could set this through the classification rule to tell them tell the program that this is a boiler uh, it's classified as the boiler and then we can use this to uh, have the uh, program search for the boilers and then search for anything that's standing within a certain reach of the boulder boiler but also uh, there is this interesting um, uh, rule set or uh, rule a general rule that we can use which is comparisons between property values so we can actually have uh, a component here that is a wall and the wall can have a certain fire rating for instance it will be EI 30 and uh, then we can have it check with related components like windows uh, a window that also needs to have the EI 30 so we can uh, we can actually tell the program that it what if we want to check every wall that has um, uh, um, Wait, let's see now. We can go into property sets and we can see whether we have, there we are, the BIP. And we have the fire rating. And it's a text. And we want the text to be IE60, maybe. And then we want to check that every window that is in this wall, a related component, um, also needs to have the EI60 value which means that we can check that the all the windows that are within a certain wall that has this this fire rating also is uh, with this fire rating so we haven't put in any uh, windows that are like without fire rating because then the whole purpose of the wall is lost and also we can do this with the doors for instance we can add uh, doors here instead of windows and check whether they have the same rating also so if I include door and I search for the same property, which is in BIP, because this is how we set it up in this um, with the KMI, and I can choose 60. I can actually add all of the type of 60s because there are different types. Okay, so it will look for walls that have AI 60, uh, EI 60, and then it will look for windows that have uh, well, doors that have EI 60, EI 60 C.
So there are a lot of uh, rules that like you can tweak uh, to be used the way you want to within the software. Uh, like the parking rule where you can set up parking spots and have them be at least a, diff, uh, a sort of um, width and length uh, height of course zero <laughs> but it might be required to have a height uh, also because you don't want pipes and stuff to go directly above the parking space and uh, you have a space validation which checks that if you have a tolerance uh, between uh, like the space needs to be confined within walls or it, it, if there's a column within the space the space is supposed to be um, um, extracting that from its own mass so you can see if um, if the spaces are relevant or are or, or right So what it boils down to actually is that you need to have the right type of information within the objects in the model for this rule set or the validation to work. But that is also why we are using the validation tool to check whether every component has what is required from our, our, uh, our um, demands that we do on the, on the project. And uh, in Sweden, we use the uh, building information properties, which is a very comprehensive system to uh, have all the information in the right place for us to be able to extract it later on. And this can be done like, I want to have all the windows in the ITO, and then I can see all the, uh, what the windows are called, if they have a, a, a sound level and a, a fire rating, which floor it is on, how many there are on this floor that had this fire rating or this type of um, properties in them. So for us at Skanska, um, Solibri is a, a really powerful tool to be able to use to validate our models in order for them to be as good as they can be when delivered to the site manager uh, or the project engineer. So they will be able to use this um, during production phase of the project, um, which is which is proven to be really, really awesome when it works in, in a good way. Also, we have gotten a lot of uh, positive feedback from the site managers and so forth because of um, how well built our models are in the end. And of course, it boils down to the designers also wanting to produce something that is, um, um, uh, feel a sort of uh, pride in their project, that is something that is uh, actually usable in the end. So, questions. Thank you for showing interest in my presentation. Thank you very much. Yes, so now we have uh, time for going through all your questions. Um, let's start. Uh, we'll start looking them through and you can send those in the chat if you have any. And we also have Lauri Luoma online from, from our team who, who can answer your questions if they are very much like Solubri specific. So um, at least there's a question um, for you, Joel, that if you export all the information from the objects, how do you know what information to trust and what not to trust? Is it controlled with LOD? Uh, it is, uh, the LOD system is actually not used that much in Sweden. We don't really have, because the LOD is, is a sort of set system for different parameters or different properties that you want to have within a project. Um, and this is very much project specific in Sweden. We use uh, uh, like higher value or um, we use more properties in some projects because we want to have more uh, to extract in the end. But we also have like a minimum what, what we always want to have and and um, um, if it's trustworthy it's actually as as much trustworthy as the um, uh, all of the the, the uh, schedules and spreadsheets that you get from 
from the drawings because the drawings is of course made from the models. Uh, the biggest issue that we do have though is there is a bit of cheating when making uh, drawings. So if if uh, a window is supposed to be uh, have a, a set um, name or a set type name, um, sometimes if if the architect is a bit like uh, cheating a bit, they can actually just put the text on the on the drawing, but it's actually not within the object. So that is something that we have to check for, of course, uh, and and compare to what. Uh, their their um, list of windows within the project uh, is set up to be. But one funny thing is that if they were to, if everybody were to work with the way that it is supposed to like the, the um, drawing software wants them to work to, to with the, for instance if you use Revit you have uh, uh, the um, the tag system. If this is used fully then we wouldn't have a problem with the models either because then all the information would be in the right place. So I hope that answers uh, the question. We trust it uh, uh, basically as much as we trust the drawings. Um, um, uh, of course if we have checked so that the drawing uh, the the uh, table uh, schedules that you get for windows is the same as in the model thanks um then there were a couple of questions um there actually are very many questions coming in so let me just check um Do you use any of the default Celebri rule sets in your work, or are, are all of the rules custom made? Uh, we use the default general intersection rule, uh, but it, it, the only thing that we tweak is that we actually want to boil it down to one millimeter instead of ten millimeters, which is set as a standard. But uh, but the, the general intersection rule is still the general intersection rule, so it it's it's only what you choose to check with or uh, with the other, but mo most of them are tweaked, yes, in order to work for for our advantage or how we want to work within our uh, our uh, projects that we have within Skanska. Um, then there's a question: uh, What happens with the model after handover? Do your clients use some kind of FM system to import the data into. Um, that, that is where we are right now. Uh, we're trying to see whether or what system we can use to be able to deliver the model as a sort of a facility management model. We actually have one project or two projects here in Gothenburg uh, uh, which are using this as a um, in its full potential, where you actually have uh, the whole model as a as a scanned model, or the, the whole building is scanned, and you use the model as the background for the scanning, and then you put it up into the the uh, uh, a cloud-based system, and then you can go into the um, and check all these parameters. Like for instance, if a window were to break um, um, after the building has been standing there for a year, we can actually go into the model in the cloud and check what were the uh, properties of this window and then you can just order a new one and replace it and you can actually see what the manufacturer are, are and everything so yeah uh, the, only in certain projects but not all um, the location setting you introduced um, are these incorporated during the design or how are these added if you look at the floor levels, uh, they're they're all automatically because uh, if you, if you look at the drawing software, if I place a door on a specific floor, it will automatically get the uh, pro, um, uh, the uh, property of standing on that floor, uh, and we just extract that information into the software. So uh, basically, it's it's done automatically. Uh, the only program that program program that has a problem with this is uh, the construction software mostly because they work uh, in a different way. They work from top to bottom instead of bottom to top. So, uh, but basically, 
it's uh, set up to to work with the federated floors of the architectural building so um, basically it's automatic um I guess there are a few questions for Solibri as well I can answer. Yes, Some please. Of them, uh, someone asking uh, if you can create rules that check if all HVAC objects are connected correctly or if there are gaps. So yes, this can be checked actually with one of the rules that uh, Joel was showing, this uh, rule uh, number 231 this uh, comparison between property values so with that you can uh, you can check for example that duct is uh, connected on both sides but this requires that uh, it's been modeled in a way that the uh, that the relations exist in this uh, beam model and then we can check that there's a uh, that every duct is connected with at least two components so that would give you a error for ducts that are where the other end is not connect, connected with anything or both ends are not connected if they are within the same system there should be a connection on both sides so yes and you can have yeah. the system also in that yeah There's someone asking any good rule for naming the rule sets so they are easy to share and name has enough information. I don't know, do you, Joel, have, I think if there's some BIM, BIM guidelines, it's of course good to name them uh, according to that, but uh, it depends a bit. Do you have a way of naming mm -hmm. them? Well, you, you, we do. You can actually name them like whatever you want to. I've tried to name uh, our uh, rule sets to match with uh, with our uh, way of working at Skanska, so that everybody who is working at Skanska, if they see something that they don't understand, what what, what does this rule mean? Um, they can actually just go to our own um, internal website where we have explanation of what everything means within the both the design phase and the construction phase. So, um, so, so for, for us, uh, we name them accordingly to what we are working with. But you can name them like whatever you want to, of course. Yeah, then we have a question um, that says, or co comment that says that the things you have mentioned are great for designers, but uh, then which of them are, are uh, uh, the kind that a site manager could use. I, I would say that, of course, the the first part is just using the software to to explain how the building is supposed to be looking like when it's uh, when it's uh, actually finished. So uh, more of the general understanding of the project instead of just looking at drawings. We've had uh, projects where they've scratched their heads and thought about, oh my God, how, what, how does this look like? There's so many levels and stuff, uh, uh, mostly in, in foundation work, where you can actually just bring up the model and um, you, um, uh, you do a, a, a sort of a, a quick section from the side and you go to that part of the model where you want to be and you can actually see it in 3D. And it explains a lot for the uh, building uh, or the, the site managers and uh, how it's supposed to look like, and it, then it's easier to understand the drawings. So it's uh, that that's the basic um, usage of the software. What we're trying to implement so that everybody can use it in that way. Uh, but you also have like the takeoff system where you can look at um, how how many uh, beams are going to be installed on this floor, which is of a certain length. So you know how to. Uh, do the unloading and uh, what uh, sort of equipment needs to be on the floor right now for this uh, part of the building. So that's the more um, advanced stuff that the site managers can use if they're more into like how the project works. What we've done at Skanska is that my role as a digital leader here uh, is to actually implement the workflow 
uh, to the um, digital leaders that are out in site operations. So we also have people who are educated to be able to use these kinds of softwares on site too. At least one or two people on each site are supposed to be able to know how to use this software and, and can show that to all of the other workers out there. Great, thanks. There are a few questions as, asking about uh, is any of these um, your like materials available for others, like for example, can you download somewhere the rule sets you have made, or, or is, do you do you uh, they, they these are, out? They are very no, yeah, no, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Within Skanska, yes. Yeah. Exactly. Then there there were a couple of questions uh, asking if you could remind what the BPI stands for. BIP. It stands for Building Information Properties, and uh, it's it's a I think it's a system set up here in Sweden for uh, the 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 digital building industry to actually have uh, the same type of of uh, in, uh, the, the information in the same place in every project, which means that we don't have to look around in the models to find the the specific property that we're looking for. It's supposed to be under the same, uh, you, uh, you saw in the demonstration, there was a sort of uh, folder uh, option that said BIP, and uh, all of the information that we've set to be in the BIP should be in that, um, below that folder. So, yeah. Yeah, then uh, what about, uh, we still have a couple of minutes uh, left for questions, and, and also uh, don't worry if we, don't answer your questions in the session. We will go all of these through and, and reply afterwards. Then, if we don't have time to go that your question through here, but yeah, so a couple of questions we still have time for. Uh, how much uh, problems do you have if, if uh, values, names, properties, or, or these type of things are in wrong places in the IFC model? Have you had these situations? Or, uh, many of these situations. Um, we we have actually, or I have actually um, educated most of the people that are using this software with just with the ITO system with the properties to be able to actually create their own ITOs. So they don't need, we have pre-made ITOs for looking for specific uh, properties in specific like BIP. Uh, like for instance, if I pull out Windows, uh, I will always find the BIPs in uh, or uh, the uh, sound rating and fire rating and the width and height and stuff in the same properties in every project. But um, if you look at like the map models where you have uh, um, like a, a duct might not have the bit code, but we still need to find out the length and the connection size of just that specific duct or all the ducts in, in the model or all the ducts on a specific floor. Um, we, we, can, um, we can actually create our own ITOs to find the specific uh, length millimeter or whatever it's called the the uh, property um, but uh, then you need to know where to look so if it's not in the bip code uh, you will need to know how the program works in order to look for it so yeah there can be quite some problems but i mean like there's always someone that knows how this works and you can always call someone and ask them to make the ITO for you. They can just send the ITO via mail or Teams or anything and then you just use it in your project. So um, not that many problems, but it's just that if you don't know where to look, it can be hard to find them, of course. Thanks. Then final question. Uh, there are a couple of uh, people asking about what BIM authoring tool you are using uh, Archicad, Revit, or other, and, and what is your preference here, and, and uh, what differences uh, do you find in this? Is there anything I, you can say about that? I, I would say all of them, uh, because when using Solibri, you're using the IFC system, and IFC exports is available from all software. Uh, for myself, when doing uh, construction, uh, I, um, um, the construction designing, I used Revit. Uh, but I have used Archicad and I have used Tecla and I have used AutoCAD also. So all of the uh, systems, I know how they work. But I would say that Archicad is probably the easiest to get the BIP standard in, at least in Sweden, because they've already implemented that in the Swedish version of the of the software. But 
Revit is a more powerful tool when building uh, uh, property sets. So really anything. <laughs> It doesn't really matter what software you use when, when you're working with Solibri. That's the beauty of it. So I don't need to have my different designers use a specific program in order for them to work with us. That's what I'm saying. So yeah. Great. Thank you. Unfortunately, we don't have now time for any more questions. Uh, so we will wrap things up, but we will uh, um, get back to the questions that we're left unanswered now, so don't worry about that. Uh, save the date for the next Customer Insights session. It will be on uh, 3rd June. We will have uh, Case Modelica, so uh, Julio Garcia and uh, Sarai Zabaya uh, are our guest speakers then, and they will talk about quality assurance in residential projects. You will get the registration link for this webinar after after this session uh, via email. Uh, it will also include the recording for this and a link for the for the uh, further Q and A answers. So thank you all for joining again uh, to our uh, webinar today, and uh, hope you all are staying safe and have a great week. Thank you very much, Joel, for being our guest speaker. It was a really great presentation, and already we saw a lot of thank you messages in the chat as well. So great to see that people were enjoying the session. Thank you, and yes, have a great thank day. You. Thank you so very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.